radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Welcome. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Today's Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Our guest tonight, Steve Bassett, is with us of uh, PRG. We're going to be discussing, oh, man, we're going to be discussing Washington, D.C., UAPs, UFOs. We have the uh, the 2023 NDAA uh, to go through and discuss uh, tonight and also, of course, the 2023 ODNI UAP UFO uh, report that was finally released uh, about a week and a half ago. And, uh, well, today's Wednesday. I'm not even sure now. It was released on a Friday. Was it this last Friday, the week before? Uh, yeah, we, we had to have been the week before. It's uh, time flies. We're going to be doing all of that tonight. And uh, before I go through a long and extensive bio for Steve, we know that he is the executive director of the Paradigm Research Group, founded back in 1996. So that means Steve has been doing this for way too long. He is seriously concerned and dedicated his life to formal disclosure by our government and other world governments. And in 2013, of course, PRG produced the citizen hearing on disclosure at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. His website is paradigmresearchgroup.org. The links are throughout social media and over on our website, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Troublemaker, and our good friend, Stephen Bassett. Stephen? Troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> good trouble. Good trouble, Jimmy. Good trouble. Uh, you look great, man. Uh, the holidays are behind us. Happy New Year. How you doing? I am incredibly excited for the year that is coming. This is going to be the year, my friend, in all ways. Uh, do you, uh, <laughs> you know, I just cut you off. Um, uh, uh, I, I want to bring up, uh, uh, not extensively or anything like this, but uh, you and I had uh, a private evening uh, at, at my house. Uh, mm -hmm. We cooked and, and drank uh, to the wee hours in the morning talking about this subject and where we are right now. And and we did it for hours and hours and hours. But and we uh, need to do it again. It's been a while. Let's do this again. I, I that was way too much fun. Yeah, wait. <laughs> you know, normally, um, Stephen. I know the audience is going to laugh. Normally, I need like a dozen guests around me to keep the conversation going. Right. No, nah, not with not with Bassett. <laughs> I just I need, take that as a compliment. Jim. I just I need, need one. I just need one. But but here we are, right? And uh, pretty exciting times. Uh, how do you feel? Let's let's actually start where we need to start. Um, every year, it's okay. This is going to be the year. Right. And we do this a decade goes by and then another decade goes by and here comes another New Year's. And ah, this is going to be the year, man. I can feel it. It's going to be the year. It's going to be the year. Well, what do you think? Is is 2023 going to be the one? Years ago, and I and I didn't prepare this in advance, so I, I, I'm going to be a little sketchy because it, it just came to me. But years ago, well before I got into this work uh so we're talking about well before 1996 could have been in the 80s and and you can probably find it if you look look online everything's online i read an amazing story about the search for the spanish uh, gold uh, galleon uh, gold, laden with gold called the atoka a-t-o-c-h-a and there was a gentleman and his family that had been looking for it right for years and years uh, you know how that can go and uh, every every year he would say, this is the year we're going to find this ship. Right. 
and tragedy happened. He lost his, I think, uh, his daughter and, and her husband when one of the boats sunk and all kinds of, and it goes on. And by God, one year they found the Atoka loaded with gold. It was a fortune. I don't know what it was. It's a great story. Uh, I think this guy's probably passed on now, but I, I that is always stuck in my mind. Um, you know, are, are you talking about um, uh, uh, pop, 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 uh, Mel Fisher? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Mel. I, I don't know. If, I think they've done a doc on it. They should do a narrative film on that puppy. Uh, yeah. What an amazing story. Look, yeah. the nature of activism is fundamentally persistence. It always has been. Why? Uh, and now I'm not saying that he was an activist. He wasn't, but he was searching for something special, something important. Activists are, are in roughly the same way, is that you are up against authority. You're up against the powers of the state. Uh, you're up against peer pressure and so forth. And so it's not going to be easy. It's always going to be tough, right? By the very nature of activism. And so Oh, the, the first thing you have to have is persistence. Uh, you, you think, gee, it would be right and just if the government were to do this. And the government says, screw you. <laughs> so right. what do you do next? And so if you look at the activist movement, they take, depending upon how important the issue is, they take longer and longer. They go through harder and harder times. But they're all marked by a relentless persistence. And they always prevail with few exceptions. And that is where the phrase, the arc of the mor a moral universe is long, but tends toward justice. It is long. And unless you're prepared to run that long race, you need to find something else. Uh, I made the decision 26 years in, uh, but there were people that got into this issue, even from the standpoint of disclosure, 55 years ago. Sure. So I, I, I'm not complaining. Uh, but is this the year? Never seen anything like it. In my 26 years and anything that's happened before that in general, nothing compares to what we're seeing right now. The um, the the amount of time uh, that you have invested and it it seems it, 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 it you know, it, it's almost like a, a dreamscape. And, and then you turn around and you look at others around us, like you're saying, right? And, and, and those that came before us, because we're riding on the backs of giants, right? Sure. And, you know, going back to Kehoe, you know, I mean, if, if you really want to think about some guys that were on a mission and talk about an activist and, and, and going up against the government, uh, there were plenty of those in, in the 50s and 60s and NICAP and, and, and the things that were going on. But... Then I just look at myself. I've been looking at this issue. I'm 60. I've been doing it since I was eight years old, right? Whoa. Eight years old. In the library, looking up UFO in in, in the encyclopedia and, and doing what, this. What and prompted you at eight years old to look up UFO in the encyclopedia? My, my next door neighbor and best friend, John Dubrava. Everybody leave John alone. Uh, this was in Chicago. I shouldn't have said his last name. No. And, um, but we were into astronauts and, and everything else. And then, you know, I had my mom who was into this too as well. But, but that's, we would sit around in, in fourth grade drawing rockets, Apollo, whatever, UFOs, moon bases. And you had uh, in 72, um, you and I are the same age. So if you go, <laughs> if you go back. I, I wish that were true, man. I if, wish it were true. You uh, are a kid. Yeah. You are a kid. You're a child, my oh, friend. He, he's got I, am, me. I am older than dirt. It's ridiculous. He, you got me by six months. I but got you by 16 years. If you, if you go back to 70. 71, 72, yeah. and, and think about 69, when you had, we think it's amazing today, but back then you had Lost in Space, you had Star Trek, uh, uh, of course, you know, things like the Twilight Zone, but um, you had the TV series UFO, which still to this day is, is one of the, did you know Strangest was on that show for an episode? That's I mean, right. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, it was it was bringing in UFO researcher from the United States, and and so he flies over to England uh, and goes to shadow you know the you know the the offices under the 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 movie studio, and starts talking about the UFO issue. But anyway, 
uh, uh, space 1999. You know, you had all these things, and UFOs and ET and contact were just uh, a, a part of me from a very young age. And so here I am at 60, mm. still chasing it, man, along with you. But I agree. Let me years. let me segue from that because I think I'd like to make an important point. Um, if you, if you look at all the great activist movements, the people that were involved early on, they get forgotten. Very few people know many, about many of the activists that really started the civil rights movement after the Civil War, certainly after Reconstruction, 70, 18, uh, like 70, 75. Uh, but there were people trying to advance the, the cause of justice for people of color all the way back 1870s, 80s, 90s, and they just kind of disappear. And then as you get closer to the success you know, where you get the prize, the activist prize. In this case, it was the Civil Rights Act. There's actually a documentary called Eye in the Prize, which is all about, it's a series, fantastic, I won awards. The people that are involved at the end, are the ones that are remembered and, and uh, they're, they're, they're held up and so forth, you get that, okay? Um, well, it's just true in this issue as well. It is. So what's different about this issue is that the, the, the efforts of the early activists in the civil rights movement, nobody denied, nobody was denying that there wasn't uh, injustice toward people of color or there weren't segregation laws or whatever. Nobody denied that. Nobody denied there was an issue. In this issue, in this, on our area, the people that were involved in trying to move this forward were doing it in, a, in, a, 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 in an arena where the government was saying, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. What are you, why are you doing this? Why are you putting your, there's, there's nothing there. Think how odd that is, how strange it is. And so all of these people, for, for even basically to today, but let's just go from 40, 40, uh, 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 seven so, to sure. about uh, even 1990. They're, they're pushing this rock up the hill and the government just flicks it down. They push it up and government flicks it down. And the academics and the journalists and so many others have pretty much gone along with the truth embargo. There's really no there there. And we feel so sorry that you're wasting your life. Now, can you imagine how easy it's going to be for those people to be forgotten? All right. Meaning, yeah. Hey, look, it turns out that uh, that uh, ETs are here. Uh, but you believed it before it was acceptable. So you're crazy. <laughs> you're right. But you're crazy. Uh, uh. So this is a special situation in terms of the history of activism. And that brings me to something I want to mention tonight. And that is this. I have been involved in developing a project for over a year. It's been hell. <laughs> you know, it's called development hell. Uh, and that's not unusual because this project is based in Los Angeles, uh, kind of in the uh, film world where development hell is taught in film school. And if you don't learn it, well, you suffer. Uh, and we're going to be announcing the particulars in about three weeks or so. Uh, so I'm limited what I can say. But the project has a couple of, uh, has, has, has several components to its mission statement. One of them is to start informing the world about this issue in a, in a way that is going to help people understand it and deal with it as it finally matures to what we'll call disclosure. But one, another part of the mission statement is that we're going to really work very hard to make sure that all of the people that have carried the water in this issue going all the way back to 45, 47 are not forgotten. They are uh, uh, brought forward, presented in, in very high uh, production values uh, and, and in quality ways so that their work is not going to be forgotten because they were trying to do something when the government said there's nothing there. And so this has come kind of a mission and a passion. Uh, I've been very fortunate that I have hooked up with some rather extraordinary people in the film industry. So you're seeing a little glimpse of that behind me. This is a studio that I'm going to be working out of. Uh, but there's much more to come. And I'll be talking about that in about three weeks. So it's it's and it's always been a thing of mine that as, as, as someone who is an activist and has admired activists through my life, that you, you know, you look at the major activist movements and you look at some of the key people and how they were held up uh, in, in, in high esteem uh, by those that supported the issue. And, you know, the issues I'm talking about. Uh, but then when you look at this issue, no, no, it's it's not like, oh, gee, I know what you want, but it, 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 it's wrong. It's like, 
you have nothing. What are you doing? This is so strange. The truth embargo is one of the strangest things any government, any empire, any any uh, uh, society I think has ever done, authority has ever done. 75 years of there's nothing there when in fact it's everywhere. And so it's a very odd situation. But thanks to the power of uh, the Internet, the power of social media, and of course, the power of film and film production, that that uh, can be rectified. And so that's something to look forward to. And uh, I'm thrilled about uh, having an opportunity to participate in it. It's um, when we uh, the foundations that you're talking about. And um, I had uh, uh, last night on the show, I had Ryan Graves um, on the show. And one of the things one of the words that was mentioned so much last night was foundation, because there's foundations to all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's now uh, referenced in the 2023 NDAA and not in the way that you would normally think. But um, I've been very vocal about this and others out there either have let this slip by or they're, they just didn't see it um, and, and they're not paying attention to it. But it's this. It's the very foundation written into law. Mm -hmm. That's in right. the 2023 NDAA is that the ODNI and the DOD must work together and investigate all military UFO reports going back to January 1st, 1945. And that report is due by law in June of 2024. Now, it's mm -hmm. right there. It's in the NDAA. Sure. And one of the things, now, that's the foundation, right? That's the that's exactly what you're talking about, right? The truth embargo that's been going on. Well, suddenly, if nothing was going on, why is it written into law that you need to go back and look at your own stuff going back to January 1st, 1945, which is also a curious date, by the way. It's not yeah, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. It's very cool. Look, Jimmy. I, I, what I'm going to do tonight, and I have it all up on my computer here, so I'm going to be reading some stuff. Forgive me, but it, it's 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 got it's uh, this language is so tricky, you know, when you're talking about uh, bills and things. But I'm going to go through parts of some of the things that have come out recently: the NDAA, the uh, the uh, report, the Arrow report, and so forth. But I'm going to pick out certain things that highlight. Uh, that, that intrigue me. In other words, I'm going to look at it through the eyes of an of an activist. Right. What does an activist see when they when they read this stuff? Because that prism, you you see things that others just don't see. Right. And, and you have if you have enough knowledge about the history and you're and you're in that activist frame of mind, some things just jump out, out at you and you go, whoa. So I'm going to I'm going to do that uh, for you tonight. We're going to go through a number of things, but I want to preface it with this. And I have been uh, repeating this in, in, in interview after interview, and it's, I'm only getting started. Uh, in fact, I just wrote an op-ed recently, which was published in the Liberation Times, Chris Sharp's fantastic new publication. Chris also is a writer uh, for The Mirror. Uh, I'm hoping that a couple of uh, other pa papers will pick it up. We'll see. But it was published, uh, I don't know, about uh, maybe, I forget what date it was, 10, 12 days ago. And it's called um, uh, the UAP, A Political Activist Perspective. Now, there is a fundamental point to this op-ed which is reflected in the very last two paragraphs. And, and what, it, what it's about is this, that disclosure was not going to happen right after Roswell. They got it under control pretty quickly. It was early. They were safe. They got five years of grace period. There was a lot of activity in the skies, but the government was okay until the major events of July of 1952, the, the overfly of Washington, D.C., which really got their attention. They realized, oh, my God, we, we, we just can't finesse this. What are we going to do? How, these, these things apparently don't want to go along with our position on this. They right. go wherever they want. And so at that point, they had a decision to make. It would have been perfectly reasonable if Truman had made the decision, look, uh, that was a pretty amazing event that just happened over D.C. Let's let's get the Congress involved. Let's start holding some hearings on this. Let's do some investigations. Let's get let's get some information to the people. In other words, let's end. Uh, not, they, let's don't start a truth embargo. Let's let's actually get it out right now. Fifty two. That was their best cho best choice. They went another way. 
they, they held a panel called the Robertson panel. It was run by the CIA. They did their study and they came up with the conclusion that, well, this thing is not really a threat to us, but the public's growing and interest in it is a threat. And they made the fateful decision rather than start the process of bringing the Congress in, getting studies, public facing activity. We're going to embargo it. We're actually going to say, no, there's nothing here. We're not going to help it along. We're going to push back in any way we can. And somehow we're going to manage the public's interest in this subject in spite of the fact the phenomenon does whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And thus, the formal truth embargo began in 1952. Okay. Now, That's wait, now, okay. So this is where I'm going to jump in uh, for a little historical perspective. When we look at uh, 1947 to 1952, 1953, 54, that period, there was nothing in the everything jets, jet engines, oh, yeah, sure. brand new technology. Okay. And so uh, the av- what was blazing speed? To the military back then was 400 miles an hour, 400, 450. And they are picking up on their radar and tracking things going 1,800, 2,000, 2,500 miles an hour, even faster than that. They're tracking and they know nothing on this planet, period, can do that. And it was obvious to a number of civilians that, of course, right? Right, right, right. 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 A different right. time, Jimmy. A different time. No, no social media, no internet. Just local papers, a couple of major papers, three television networks, relatively fledgling. The the the, the it was post World War II. Our, our government, our military was in high esteem, and so the idea. It, it's hard to 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 put ourselves back there. We're thinking from the modern time, presentism, but the fact is. The fact that the government was willing to say, look, no, uh, this is not an issue. It's not a threat, whatever. And don't worry about it. People went, okay. They just did, even though it was kind of obvious. However, as you point, because it was so obvious, wait a minute, a number of people said, "Uh uh-uh, right? And they jumped in to deal with what to to them was clearly non-human tech. Well, as you can imagine, they had a rough road going forward. And so- it's taken 75 years to go from the obvious conclusion to the, the, a final, a finally a public facing engagement that will allow them to tell us what was obvious 75 years ago, which brings me to the point of this op-ed. OK, and this is something that I hope people will listen to carefully because it will be helpful to you. And this is how I finish. The appropriate and public facing actions now underway, should have taken place 70 years ago, 1952-53. At that time, those with a need to know and others within the DOD, CIA, Congress, and the media were aware UAP were real and controlled or piloted by non-human entities. And that remains the case in 2022. Why was the government aware? They had a vehicle, at least one, and bodies, and they weren't human. That's about as aware as you can get. That's right. So is this awkward because they knew then, right? Yeah, it is kind of awkward. But is it necessary that they go through this public facing process and all these good things we're seeing that could have been done 70 years ago? Yes, it is. The legislation, the DOD cross agency working group, which we'll talk about. Statements by congressional members and former national security executives and the public congressional hearings certainly to come is a process not to finally get to the bottom of this issue, but rather to correct the record that we got to the bottom of this issue 75 years ago, at least the key issue, in a responsible and minimally disruptive manner. In other words, they're doing the right thing late, but they're doing it because that's the best way to wrap this up. And I finish with this. It is a public relations-driven extrication process to reduce blowback over the 75-year truth embargo while building a platform on which the president can stand to confirm the extraterrestrial presence to the American people. Disclosure. Now, when I read that um, uh, the first time through, I thought this is a point not only that we need to stress, but I think we're all thinking about it. Right? Yeah, but we're nobody's not, raising it. I, I think I'm the only person that isn't, right, right. isn't raising it in the media. No, we're not talking about it enough. And uh, it, it, I was like, right on, Steve. And the, and, and here's my point with that. 
every time uh, this issue is sort of talked about, it, it, it gets a little bit scary. It, 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 it's scary in this regard. We want disclosure, right? We want this. We, you know, we want the president to come up and go, okay, we're not alone, man, and check this out. We've known for a while. Well, it, at, at that point, what you're talking about, that they are now in uh, putting themselves in, a, in an impossible position. So how do we, because there's too many questions after, there's legal ramifications that. Not impossible, tough. It's a tough, it's, tough, it's tough situation. Yeah. Right. So they're going to avoid that, right? There's got to be advisors sitting around going, okay, no, we can't do it for these reasons. And it's enough to scare everybody, right? Sure. But, but what has happened, Jimmy, is they finally, enough people inside have finally come to the, the personal understanding conclusion that we can do it. We have to do it. Right. In other words, uh, they had an opportunity back in 53 to get this done. Uh, I'm not going to say 47. It could have happened in 47 if the president had been a little slow in getting in touch with Roger Ramey. But but it didn't happen. OK. But 53, they clearly had an opportunity. The damn things were flying all over Washington, D.C. They were seen for like over 13 days, but they didn't do it. I, I understand why it had to do with you know, Cold War, nuclear weapons, the Soviet threat, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and many other things. Now, when they when they initiated the truth embargo formally in 53, I don't think they thought that we'd still be under embargo this many years later. I think they probably thought, look, we're going to do this for a while. Things will settle down and we can we can get this forward. But because it stretched out, the problem changed back in 53. There was concerns that, well, you know, if we get this out. The people may not be able to handle it very well. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing, pretty startling, upsetting, you know, and maybe people will get upset. 70, 73 years later, the problem is not the people. It's the government. The reason that they're unable to get it done is the government's going to get upset. We're going to be under barrage of terrible questions, public relations problems. It's going to be a nightmare, lawsuits, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's flipped. But the fact is, it's not going to be that way. It's not. And, no, I, I, just, I, I don't think it's going to be that way. And and we the issue, uh, the way that it is played out, the way that you presented it there, which is the way it's played out, mm -hmm. is that there was a hysteria in 1952. Yeah, absolutely. A little, People a little. were freaking out. Well, you know, and, and all the headlines and, and things were. And so and coming right off of World War Two and nuclear bombs and suddenly you're going to throw this out there on the world. Well, OK, I could understand a concern about freaking out the citizens of, of the United States and the world. I dig that. But we've had this exposure now for 75 years. And Not to mention 500 uh, fine films made in the film industry with these I mean. in them. Yes, 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 yeah. So, no, the world's not going to freak out. In fact, they're expecting this. Right? Yeah, Nobody's it's gonna... anticlimactic, right? They're irritated because it's taking so long. Mom, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? So it's 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 a very kind of biz no no activist movement. I, nothing in, like this in history I think has ever happened. In other words, they, they at some point they've got to end this policy of embargo, where they suddenly, uh, the, the, what, where they're going to go through a process in which they're going to say effectively, that thing that we told you didn't exist 75 years ago, it, it does exist. And actually knew it about it 75 years ago. And for various reasons, we didn't tell you. Now we're telling you. Okay, now this is tough. Very, very tough because it's, tough. it's not just any issue. It has implications across a huge spectrum of, of human endeavor and so forth and so forth. So, okay, it's a big deal, which is why the way to do it, even though it's a little awkward, and, and this is what I'm getting at, is that, okay, let's do what we should have done in 1953. Let's do all of the right things. Set up working group, put down legislation, ask them what to do, uh, uh, start having talk, talking to witnesses and what have you, uh, taking the issue seriously, and moving in a, a reasonably fast pace towards uh, a situation, almost certainly based upon hearing testimony, extraordinary hearing testimony, where the president can finally say, look, the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, uh, this is confirmed. It's it's non-human tech. And uh, we're going to be getting information about that in much greater depth to you soon. Then when the questions start pouring in, they'll be drowned out 
by the huge number of people that don't care about what happened in 53, particularly the millennials. They don't even know what happened in 53. They care about the fact that they, 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 are, they just learned that we're not alone in the universe. Tell us more. Thank you, my government. This is the way it has to happen. Now, why am I making a big deal out of this? Two reasons. One, as you read through the laws and you watch the press and you see these announcements from various people, if you can keep in your back of the mind, back, back of your mind, this truth that they've all they known, they've known for 75 years. Those that have had a need to know knew. Those that were tipped off knew. Those that figured it out on their own because they read some decent books and watched some docs knew. So they have already they already known. They already knew. And so when you look at this stuff with that in mind, it starts to make more sense. It's less upsetting. It's less irritating. All right. You see the way they go about it is to serve this what I call extrication process where you can't go too far, but you also don't want to debunk. You want to move forward. You don't want to create problems. You stay within certain lanes as long as you keep moving forward toward disclosure. Everybody wins. OK. And so with that in mind, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of jump into okay, some of the stuff no, we've seen. What was your point to the second way it would happen? Uh, let me think now. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, that, but, I'm not that, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, said, I, I lost it. it that's, <laughs> there wasn't a point to. We're not uh, even drinking <laughs> vodka, man. We're not even drinking. Uh, but I do have the special stuff here uh, waiting uh, for you, Steve. Okay. So, uh, but l l let me jump in. That part uh, and, and and it's exposure at that point. It's not necessarily disclosure, right? It's, it's exposure. But... That's that side of it. That's, we've known for 75 years. There's a whole other, that's the military, that's the government. That, that's, that's, that's the other part about a saucer sitting out here in Palmdale at Lockheed, a flying oh, yeah. saucer that, that the government doesn't know about, that special access programs, that they, they, they're concerned, you know, the NDAA doesn't have any nouns or verbs in there uh, concerning a backwards engineering spacecraft. That, that's not in there. And th the politicians that are dealing with this in the Beltway are not aware of this either. If right. that gets exposed, now we've got a real issue. It's not about they've known or made contact or have observed, or but if, it, if, it, if that becomes a reality, now we've got a problem. Well, it will. But the, again, the question is, you want it to become a reality in a way that is responsible and not destructive. There's really two things. One one is fairly tight. One is huge that we're dealing with. One is the okay, core wait, point. Wait, hold on. Keep those two points. Okay. Let me ask you this, though. In this exposure, would you expect the government to also say, that we have a craft. We actually have a craft. We think it can fly. Okay. This is the point I'm trying to make. There's two things here. The w one thing which is fundamental to the activism is, does the government know we have a non-human presence, high technology in our world, almost certainly from off planet? Does the government know that? Just that. They do. And they have for since 70, 47 minimum, probably even slightly before that. Now, that's that's one thing. But you see how important that is. I mean, that's critical. Just knowing that is incredibly significant. And disclosure, as I define it, capital D, the event is just about confirming the central point. Yes, there are extraterrestrials. That's all that it is. Now, the other thing is this huge thing which encompasses Everything we have learned since then and the accumulation of uh, information within the government and the private sector and all of the possibilities and speculations, all of that, of course, we want to get to. But in order to get to it, it's clear we need to go through that first fundamental stage. You must get the government to acknowledge the presence. Once you have the disclosure event, then all of this other stuff now can le legitimately come into play. Not not haphazardly, not ridiculous in an in a, uh, uh, absurd way, but it, in other words, disclosure gives reasonable license to every aspect of every government to start bringing information to the public. 
In other words, that the embargo is over. Now we're going to start telling you the rest, but responsibly. It doesn't mean we're just going to dump it out on the White House lawn and let you go through the boxes. No, but people are going to start getting information. And 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 they're going to start learning the rest of the story. Will there be a point where they'll stop and say, look, there's a more to this, but that's classified. We'll see. And what people need to understand, a lot of people say, no, we want that whole big thing first. Get right. us all the information. We want all that now. We don't need disclosure. Wrong. Uh-uh. You're not going to get that big information until you get that formal confirmation. Everything that's going on right now is not so much about getting all that big information out, right? And and if you read through this stuff, you realize, no, no. It's about the basic processes that you would go through in order to establish the fundamental premise. Are we alone? Is this non-human tech? Yes, that's what this is about. And the thing that makes it a little crazy is they already know. And so if they already know, why go through this? Because when you're dealing with something of this magnitude with the implications that it has involving the Congress and the DOD setting up the, uh, the, the study, setting up the uh, information exchanges, all of that isn't, you need to do that, right? Whether you knew or didn't know. So they're doing the right thing. Now, now, now one question, one point that gets brought up to me, well, then they're just throwing money down the drain. I mean, they already know. So they're setting up all this stuff. We're studying this, going to get the reports, look at this, look at that. It's just, it just, all this infrastructure is going to be wasted. No, it's not. You want to know why? Because why? once the president ends the truth embargo by, by giving us disclosure, capital D, all of this infrastructure is going to be needed more than ever. Now you've got the whole world coming to the government and say, what do you got? What's going on? Get into this, get into that. We want more reports. We want this. And they said, no problem. We're set up. We're set up. we got a massive cross-agency working group here, and now we're unleashed. In other words, we are untethered, you might say. We're going to start really be able to get stuff to you, and so they're just going to repurpose it, right? They're going to repurpose it for the post-disclosure world. Now, some people are thinking, this kid is crazy, but look, I'm telling you, I've been at this a long time, and I know enough to know that the idea that this is all this is happening because the U.S. government suddenly realized, oh, my goodness, there's this phenomenon we don't understand. And it's a potential threat. We should probably set up a working group. We should hold hearings. Give me a break. No way. That's not what's happening. What's happening is what do we have to do to get the disclosure in a responsible way so that the public relations impact is not too awful and that people will be forgiving and understanding so that we can then then move on to the really interesting stuff. That's what's going on. And I'm going to keep telling this uh, at, you know, at every opportunity because, one, people will have less, less angst and upset about it and less cognizant dissidents, but also for this somewhat subtle reason. It's okay for the people to know that. It's, you can know that this is what's going on and still be very supportive like I am. Yeah, I get it. You knew, but okay. Now you're doing the right thing. Good. Good on you. Just don't drag it out. Let's get on with it. Let's move along. And I assure you the pace is far faster than you know these reports that are due in 2025 and 20. Oh, forget that. Get, get on with it, right? Uh, they are, they're going to be a much more understanding. All right. And that that's important. But also there's a I don't know. It's kind of a personal thing. Look, in order to end this truth embargo, they're literally having to, quote, lie their way out from under a lie. There's a whole lot of things being done and said that are mendacious. They're misrepresented because they have to stay within certain lines, things they can't say. And to their good credit, they do a lot of can't talk about that. And you're thinking, you know, if you just learned about this, what is it that you can't talk about? Uh, well, that's okay. All of this is a lot, but but it is in fact lying to end a lie. And therefore, my feeling is this: I want people to know the truth. The truth is they're lying their way out from under a lie, and to me, that makes it a little more acceptable. In other words, I don't want the the end of the truth embargo to be basically another how would you say true mis misrepresentation? I mean, it is a misrepresentation, but I don't want people to, 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 to know that. I want them to understand that there, this is, this is a, a process to good purpose. And while they are, they are being mendacious, you know the truth. In other words, you know what they're doing. And therefore, it makes it to me less, more acceptable and less disturbing 
right? Yeah, I don't think they're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think what I'm gonna, saying. I, it's a little awkward, but I, that's that's what I'm trying to get. To. I don't think they're going to kick the can down the road uh, no, this time no. around. Uh, no and, but but there's another thing that comes into play here. And then I want to get to your points on uh, the NDAA, and we still have to get to the ODNI tonight too, as oh, well. Yeah. A lot of stuff uh, here, but um, it, th- there's another there's another uh, card that is and uh, that is going to be played, and that's the James Webb Space Telescope. And so, if I had a crystal ball here, this is my crystal ball. It's very rarely wrong, Steve. I'm I'm wrong, but not that often because you I have a lot of money. I have a great, <laughs> and, that, and, and that crystal ball is telling me that we will get the announcement um, uh, about the past and and where we are today and what the government knows Mm -hmm. after the James Webb telescope confirms a techno signature on an exoplanet. Once that went, went, because that the the James Webb is international. Okay. That it it is not a, a United States project. It's an international project with international scientists and astro- astronomers that are involved and physicists. Mm-hmm. And so when that techno signature biosphere evidence of uh, uh, an advanced extraterrestrial civilization, that announcement happens, you've got to come clean and you have the support of science. So it's in my estimation that it's going to happen soon. Look, I've, I've talked about this on a number of shows. It is, is certainly, I know that they've thought about it. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, we've got an awkward situation here. What if uh, we did find a, a clear artifact on Mars, you know, you know, sort of an iPad thingy or whatever, uh, and then we revealed that? And people go, oh, my God, there had to have been a civilization on Mars a billion years ago. That would kind of break the ice a little that bit. Would, you know? that, would, that, would, that would ease the pain. You could rip the Band-Aid yeah. off at that point. So, but, but, but again, we're talking, you know, again, it's a safer play because again, whatever was on Mars, it was a billion years ago. They're long gone. Same thing with the web. They, 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 they may discover through the web, a, a, a clear indication of a life planet and might even maybe pick up some satellites cruising around it. Therefore, they've just confirmed that there's life on this thing out there. Keep in mind that the light that came from that planet probably uh, is, is like, uh, you know, 400 million years old. So again, a safe play. And I know that they thought about that and I could get the logic, but there is a problem there. Okay. Because while it does kind of take a little of the sting out of the issue and it does open the door a little bit for people to come forward, it still doesn't alter the fact they've been lying about this since 47. It doesn't right? doesn't alter that. It doesn't alter anything, but it takes the focus off of Washington, D.C., and well, we can- no, it's going to put the focus on D.C. because that's just going to increase the pressure on the truth embargo. But what here's the here's the downside to it. It's like what the government's trying to do is say to show the people, you know, we finally come to our senses and we're doing the right thing. We're doing what we should have done. See us do this. Look at all these things we're doing. Look at the legislation. Look at the witnesses that are coming forward. Look at the DOD coming together and all this wonderful stuff. We're doing the right thing. You don't get that if they suddenly just find something on Mars. What you get there is, wait a minute, artifact on Mars? Yeah, sure, it's a billion years, but clearly there's life outside the planet. That just confirms you've been lying all these 72 years, and they haven't started doing the right thing yet. You see the problem? I do. They lose well, most I, of the, the public relations benefit. It, it does. And so uh, and my point that I'm making uh, that if you have suddenly a conversation going on about planet number three at TRAPPIST-1, that's got a techno signature. We can see the lights of cities there and they've got carbon gases and, and pollution and, and things. There's that. And so that conversation is going to be going on instead of the singular conversation of disclosure here. You'd have both going on at the same time, takes the heat off of one and you got a, a shared pressure uh, to deal with instead of a singular pressure point. Well, they both are going on at the same time. I happen to think the government has photographs from, <laughs> from their too. work that confirms it that are nicely tucked away in some vaults, which sure. is another awkward thing. But here's a, here's a simpler way to put it. If we go through the process that's underway now and it allows the president to, in a fairly nonpartisan way, confirm the ET presence, there's massive political benefits to that. 
Okay, everybody's winning. The Congress, both parties, the DOD, the president, everybody's greatest event in human history. If if suddenly the Webb telescopes discover that it looks like there's sentient life on a planet two, two billion light years away, there's no political benefits. You see see what I'm getting at here? This uh, is a complex yeah. process. Yes, yes, yes. Except, and this is just like dinner at my house. This is what it was like. Because I have to go, except, Steve. Without the ribs. <laughs> without the ribs. The, <laughs> is that what we did that night? Was it yeah, ribs? I think it was steak. It was steak and salad. It was a steak. Yeah. And, and, and I ate huge amounts of chocolate peanuts if i oh, that's, <laughs> that's right you yeah. ate uh, or maybe it was chocolate cashews i wrote it till my way through a whole can it was uh it was amazing chocolate al- dark. dark chocolate almonds i think is what it was yeah, yeah, okay. I think that was it, yeah. but but it, it it's this if uh if things fire off and fire off really quickly and nasa suddenly has this under their, you know, you can tuck this in, in into their belt. NASA's got all the funding that they cry about oh, sure. funding all the time. Sure. Well, you NASA want- has been tied down, like in the like the Little Pullins, what was it, that, 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 uh, that, that book, uh, tied down to the ground, right, by by the strictures. Lily, the Lily put, Lily Un- put. Lily. Uh, yeah, Lily put, unable to, 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 to basically do the thing that would probably get them more attention and more money. Uh, and they've suffered because of it. So it was incredibly significant when Bill Nelson was put in charge of NASA, former astronaut and Intel Senate, Intel committee Senator. And then he comes out and says, we're, we're into it. We're look, we're investigating. So this process is not just about helping the public relations issues that the Congress or the president face also NASA air force, all of them face serious uh, public relations image issues, post-disclosure. And so to the extent they're doing the right thing, which NASA is doing under Bill Nelson, the public is, the, the millennials are going to go, hey, I, I'm great with it. And the old guard who have been around and know better are going to be generous. And so again, that's how I invite people to look at this. And that way they will be, they won't be so irritated when there's something in the act and you're going what do you mean you're looking at that? Hell, that was covered in 1962 in this book or that book. No, they're 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 they're, they're starting in a sense from scratch in a way, but it's because they need to do it that way. And I'm totally supportive of that unless somehow they get the idea, okay, it's working so well, let's drag it out. Let's see if we can drag this out to 2030. No, that's going to no, go no. very badly. Yeah, that's not the way it's going to go down. No. And I I I firmly believe that the world is not going to freak out. And I think no. the majority of the world, um, it would uh, it would be headline news for a minute. It, it'll be a brand new day 24 hours later. And people well, it'll be headline news for like weeks and months. I mean, it yeah, will be a journalistic right. uh, tsunami. Yeah, but, I know. Uh, I know. You don't have to argue every point that I say. But here's the, <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, you're with me here in Southern California. We have the 405 and the 101, the busiest intersection in the world, right? Right here, right, right Mm -hmm. there. 405 and the 101. It's crazy. 5 PM. It's the worst traffic on planet earth at that moment. If a flying saucer came down and landed in the middle of the 405 and blocked rush hour traffic, you would have some people freaking out, shooting cell phones. And that would last for about 15 minutes. But about 15 minutes later, you're gonna have people going, get that friggin' thing off of the freeway. Oh, I misunderstood you. you Look, know, the, the public will go, will, will go, okay, fantastic. And then a week later, you know, it's like, okay, what do you got next? I was right. referring just to the media. The media oh, is gonna go media. nuts because we're yeah. talking story, we're talking eyeballs, we're talking money here. So <laughs> they will just feast on it for weeks and months. But you know, there's a lot of people going, hey, I knew that 15, 25 years ago. Yeah, okay? so what what yeah. have you got for me? Okay, show me some crap. Uh, uh, what kind of tech have you got? All of these questions are gonna come up. And the process will will get underway in the post disclosure world, which is where we're going. And uh, the one of the one of the things that's been happening in the last ten years, particularly with the rise of podcasting and, of course, more shows like yours and and so forth, is that the ability of the public now to ensure 
that they will be fully engaged in this issue, that they're not going to be just waiting for the next press release from the Pentagon. I assure you, we have a massive media and social media infrastructure ready to come in and feast on this. And I think they know that, and I'm sure they're going to cooperate with it. So it's like, hey, we are not going to be left off the stage this time when this happens. Uh, and that's very important. And I think they know that. Let me add something that I mentioned before. And this is from an inside source I have. I don't have many. I get a couple. Yeah, nothing special. But my understanding is, is that in the early 90s, the Pentagon uh, provided a multi-million dollar contract to a major public relations firm in, in uh, Washington, D.C., which I believe is Hill and Knowlton. It's a big firm, big deal. Multi-million. What was the classified, of course. What was the, the deal? Game this thing out. Study and get back to us a report of the various ways we could go about finally confirming ET presence to the public. Okay. And while you're at it, game out the various ways the public might react and institutions and any will react to disclosure. So in other words, give us a picture on this from a public relations perspective. Remember, the, the Department of Defense has got supercomputers running supercomputers. They can game things down to the granular level. They're not public relations specialists, so they wanted it from that point of view. Apparently, you know, four or five years later in the late 90s, they got that report back, right around the time that I think the Rockefeller Initiative was wrapping up uh, the Clinton administration. The point I'm making is, look, do you think the government hasn't thought about how this would go down, how the disclosure process might unfold, particularly at a national security level, and how, uh, how they would handle it? Of course they have. They've gained it eight ways to Sunday. So it's not Believe me. So what you're seeing is not something that just got thrown together at the last minute. This has been in the works for a long time, but mm -hmm. it needed a trigger to sort of get it going. Because I'm sure that in spite of their plans and what they would like to do, there's an internal inertia. Because, again, huge, huge public relations issues. Why not just pretend it's not there, kick the can down the road, wait till I'm retired. But that trigger was 2017. One can say it was the To the Stars Academy announcement in the film where Mellon and Elizondo got up there and said some rather amazing things. Others will say it was the New York Times articles, uh, those massively important articles that were printed on two consecutive days, December 16th, 17th, first on, on, on the web and then online. Whichever, the, this was the trigger that set in motion what they had probably been thinking of doing for a long time but couldn't. It was set in motion by people operating pretty much, I think, on their own. This was personal stuff. It wasn't some orchestrated thing from within the DOD. Okay, guys, do this, do that. Pretend you're – no, no. This was good people making, hey, enough is enough. We're going to act on our own. But it is notable that, you know, they didn't all end up on an island somewhere or, you know, <laughs> forced to work underground at Area 51. I mean, they were allowed to go forward. So it means that overall, even though a lot of the government was surprised by what happened in, in October and December of 2016, rather, yeah, 2016, ultimately, and there was some pushback and there were some people going, what are you talking about? No, that's not true. And because they, they didn't have the, 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 the they didn't have the right information. They were allowed to go forward, weren't they? They were allowed to go forward. And when things didn't work out the way they initially planned, they didn't they weren't blocked when they came out fundamentally with the to the stars academy in 2017. In other words, there was a fundamental resignation within the military intelligence complex. The trigger's been pulled. OK. Let's go with this and see what happens. Well, and what didn't happen, Steve? The Vatican didn't implode. People didn't jump no. off. Pool. Wall Street didn't collapse. And I think the general, uh, when I talk to people that have nothing to do with, never seen an episode of Ancient Aliens, never heard of uh, Coast to Coast or Fade to Black. Um, when I talk to them about this, I'm like, well, the universe is a big place. Of course, we're not alone. Sure. So what's, the, what's the big deal here? I think I think that was the average. Uh, the world. It wasn't the Condon Report 2.0, right? It wasn't the Robertson. It wasn't Rand Corporation's analysis no, on that. No, it's unprecedented. It, it was absolutely. unprecedented, and uh, and uh, um, I, I think that. Look, 
I, I think I know what the original plan was and, and things happen. Look, when you're trying to work on something like this, this level, uh, this importance, man, history can just throw you curveballs all day long. And so this thing is dragged down a lot longer than I think it would have because of developments around the world and what have you. This is this happens. It's not really anybody's fault. It is just life. So it's dragged it out, which made it a little tougher. All right. And, and a little more awkward. Uh, but nevertheless, in spite of all that has happened in the last five years, chaos and new wars and nuclear threats and, you know, the odd massive worldwide pandemic, they've continued on anyway. All right. And now we're practically on the threshold. And I'll be getting to that in, in a little bit when I get into the, the granular stuff. But it, I'm impressed by the fact that this thing has just moved forward relentlessly, no matter what has been thrown at it. Now, a nuclear war is definitely going to uh, interrupt the process. It's going to be bad. OK, it's bad. Bad for disclosure. Bad for everything. Let's yeah, hope we don't happen. have that. OK, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not. No, it's not. Uh, let's take our break right here, Steve. And when we come back, we'll get we'll go granular. Granular. Absolutely. Go. That's a great word. Well, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what was that? Uh, where are the chocolate almonds? Well, we're on break. I can't yeah. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Check out Billy Carson's Forbidden Knowledge. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv where you can get access to over 6,000 videos, movies, TV series, exclusive documentaries like the Black Knight Satellite. You can do it all for just $7.77 per month or $77 per year after the three-day trial, which is also totally free to check out. It's all simple to do. Billy Carson is the best. It's simple. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv TV. That's the number four for BK. I will be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton right here in Los Angeles, California. 200 speakers, including Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, George Nori, Daniel Sheehan, Scott Walter Shonstone, and David Wolf. Over 200 vendors, special events. This is the biggest event of its kind on planet Earth. You've got to come and hang out with all of us. Tickets and info at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. The links are below. On Saturday, April 1st, that's right, April Fool's Day, 2023, I will be hosting the Parapod Festival at the Hyatt Regency right here in Valencia, California. It's a live, one-day podcast awards. It's a film festival. It's a full-on media event. We're going to have Sky Watching. There's going to be a Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Linda Moulton Howe. Right now, you can submit your podcast, your film, your TV series, any of your paranormal media for consideration. You can do all of that on the links below. For info and tickets, go to parapodfilmfest.com. That's parapodfilmfest.com. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right. Up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit DivineTravels.com forward slash Hidden Secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com all right welcome back our guest tonight Stephen bassett of uh prg and we are breaking down uh, a few things tonight we are right in the middle of uh 2023 and some serious movement 
on uh, disclosure and, and ET and, and, and what is going on, not only with, with our planet, but the universe around us too as well. And uh, we are about to go granular into the NDAA and which uh, I, you know, there's over 40 pages of uh, the 2023 budget uh, dealing with uh, the UAP issue specifically. And, mm -hmm. and Steve, when you say going granular, I'm very interested in, in what you're going to pick first. So uh, <laughs> what's, what's, what's top of the list? Yeah, there's no special order to this, but I'm just pointing out some interesting things that I think will amuse. Um, and I should mention, forgive me, but I'm going to follow up on your, your break. Uh, I'm going to be speaking. I'm going to be at the uh, Conscious Life Expo, my first uh, onstage stuff in three years. I'm also going to be at the uh, UFO Expo in March in Roswell. They're actually holding another conference in Roswell. And then there's going to be a massive contact in the desert. It's back. That is in June 2 to 4. I'm going to be presenting extensively there. And there's going to be much more to talk about. But the conferences are starting to shape up. This could be the best year of conferences ever because, well, it's time to move on with life. And the issue is en fuego. So I just want to mention that. Okay. Now, let's first talk about the report. It was, uh, I don't know what it was. What was it? 22 pages, I think. And by the way, I'll put some links on my social media, Twitter and Facebook with the links to all these little thingies. You want to go grab them easy. And since I mentioned that, and because there's a lot of things coming from my world, uh, 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 Paradigm Research Group has a Twitter account. Uh, please, if you if you uh, follow it, you'll you'll get stuff from me all the time about this. Plus, I need more followers, please. Facebook as well, Paradigm Research Group and Steve Bassett, but certainly Twitter. I'll put some links up on the social media. So the report comes in, and um, this paragraph is like the fourth paragraph, and I'm going to read it because I want you to to get its power. All right, <laughs> because this this paragraph has never been written anywhere prior to this report going back to the end, of beginning of time. It says this report was drafted by the ODNI's NIM Aviation Group, which is the one that put out that patch with the little saucer on it. That was kind of a joke. In conjunction with Aero, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is the final, the one, they had two other things they came up with. The acronyms were unbelievably awful. This is perfect. All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office does not have UAP in it and doesn't have UFOs in it, right? It's, but when you pronounce the acronym, you get arrow, right? Clearly indicating something in the air. I love this. It includes input from the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, the USD INS, the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, the National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, the National Security Agency, NSA, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marine Corps, the U.S. Air Force, the Federal Aviation Administration, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, that would be NASA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, the Department of Energy, the DOE, the ODNI, NIM, Emerging and Disruptive Technology Group, Whoa, the ODNI National Counterintelligence and Security Center, the NCSC, and ODNI National Intelligence Council, ODNI NIC. <clears throat> what, what happened there? What just happened there? They're basically saying that all of these entities are reporting to Arrow to create this report. What is, what is this? This is called a cross-agency working group. That is what is being set up in response to the legislation. Who isn't in that group? I mean, this is, this is, this is it. This is the, uh, what, I don't know what to call it. And so, whoa, all right? That is massive, okay? And that is a cross-agency working group. And I want to explain what that is because a lot of people don't know what that is. A cross-agency or interagency working group is something that is set up across two, four, five, 15, 20 entities as needed to deal with an important issue. In, in good order, probably already happening, there will be two, 3,000 people in that working group, all right? But this is what people need to understand. 
that doesn't mean that those people don't have a job. They, they have other jobs within these entities that they do, their core job. However, they have been assigned to this working group to participate. So it's like part-time, little part-time thing across all of these agencies. It's not like they're forming some massive office with a building and they're sticking 2,000 people in it to work on this. No, this is much more efficient and effective. So now what they're saying is we have people now addressing this issue across all of these entities, the creme de la creme, and they're going to be reporting to us. That's even bigger than setting up, I don't know, just an apartment. They're basically saying the whole government's on board. The entire military intelligence community is on board. We're working for you. OK, that's what I want to get across. So that paragraph alone is worth uh, that report. It, it, it basically sends a message to everybody. My God, everybody's in on this. Uh, so wait for new developments. Now, is there um, with that, though, is there somebody and I don't think it's Moultrie or Bray or, or or any of the, the names. I think that the, the current director of Arrow as well is slated uh, to be Kirkpatrick. Yes, is, that is uh, currently uh, slated. Um, uh, powerful enough as a as a figurehead to make sure you, you've, you've got to be a sheriff with bullets in your gun. Right. And you have mm -hmm. to make sure that people aren't sitting on their hands or that, you know, if they don't bother us, then we're not, we don't have to give anything up and we don't want to share our secrets. And which is the interagency problem that's been going on forever. That is yeah. a problem in Washington, D.C. Uh, agencies don't cooperate uh, with each other. And so you need to have somebody in place to make sure and, and to keep the fires burning that's the, uh, uh, that uh, somebody's paying attention. And, and, and who, who is strong enough, who's big, a big enough of a figure to go in there to make sure that we have a UAP czar that is going to uh, uh, keep the coordination going with uh, all of this interagency dependence? Star power. I get, well, they're not making a tentpole movie with a $200 million budget and they've got to get a $40 million actor in there. No, that's not what they're doing. The power of Arrow comes from this. Okay. First of all, it comes from the fact that under the legislation, Arrow is under the aegis of not just the DOD, but the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. In other words, it's two the DOD and the ODNI are jointly controlling, overseeing this project. What's bigger than the DOD and the Office Director of National Intelligence? So anybody out there that's going, ah, screw this, I'm not going to do that. Let me just take a vacation, whatever. Uh oh, they're in deep trouble. That, that alone has sent the message, we are really serious about this, okay? Because if they're not, they're not just going to embarrass the DOD. They're going to embarrass a major uh, position in the administration of the current president. So that's part of where the power comes. And the other power comes from what I just read to you. They're saying, look, under federal legislation, all of these entities, which is pretty much everything out there uh, of, of significance in the military intelligence world, are part of this process. They don't need a star running it. The process itself, right, is overwhelming. And so believe me, there won't be any problem, right, in terms of people dragging their feet. Th this is the real deal, folks. Even though they should have done it 70 years ago, this is the real deal. Any debunker or anybody that wants to kind of throw the, you know, a monkey wrench into this is probably making a career ending mistake. Yeah. Now, uh, and, 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 and so uh, we'll, we'll go to your next granular uh, position here. <laughs> Yeah. But you have to, it's one thing to, because it looks great on paper, right? It does. I, man, I, yes. Yeah. You have to make it happen. It it's is happening. It, look, this group is being set up. I have inside information. I mean, I, I have, I know people in the group. They're setting this thing up across all these agencies, right? It's not, this is going to happen. No, it's happening now. They're not going to tell you. All the details of that. That's not the way it works. It's it's not it's their business for now. Uh, you could there are people, God bless them. My good friend John Greenwell will will certainly be doing it, filing in FOIAs, trying to get information about what's going on. But this is a rapidly growing massive process. There's no way we could keep up with it, but it is happening. All right. And that's, that's I, I agree with you that it's happening, but you need to have somebody with a puffy chest 
that can go to the Air Force and go, let's go. Right. Well, because the DOD is, is running this program and that puppy chest would be the secretary of defense. In other words, the secretary of defense is the titular head of one of the co-entities that is creating an, an, an overseeing arrow. And so if you want to piss on it, well, you're going to get a call from the sec def and it's going to go badly for you. So don't worry about the gravitas. It's overwhelmingly filled with gravitas. Um, and uh, th those that are frustrated by all these decades of of uh, of, of denial and so forth, I, I they're they're going. I'll see it when I believe it. Look, all my my entire job is to simply watch all this happen. And so uh, I realize there are people that are frustrated, but they're not they're not paying attention at this level. I, I why should they? I'm right. paying attention right. for them, and I've got colleagues doing the same thing. And so look, relax, chill. It's happening. Right. And, and, and the one thing I tell people to say, oh, OK, what can I do? What can I do? Simple. Right? You don't have to you don't have to form a whole new group or whatever. Go and write a book. Go on Twitter and, and particularly Twitter and start firing off praise to every single person doing the right thing. OK, fire off Twitter. And, and almost all of them are on, on Twitter. Everybody's on Twitter. Right. Yes, fire yep. off praise to Adam. You know, not to to uh, Mark Warner and Mark Rubio to Burchette and Gallego. Right. To Gallagher, Carson. Right. Fire off praise to to uh, Tucker Carlson and any of the journalists that are writing good articles. Send them tweets saying we really like what you're doing. And this is something that has been absent because of the frustration and anger over this issue. It is 10 times easier to get people to move forward when you praise them than when you tell them what an asshole they are. They yeah, are. Okay? Right. And it's been mostly the, the latter. Now we need to go to the former. And now we have a basis to do it. Look at all this good stuff they're doing. Right. And so I'm telling people, look, go on Twitter and praise the hell out of them. Because, you know, when people get praised and you know this in your life. They love to tell other people about it. Oh, I got this fantastic tweet. Oh, man, I heard this from my supporter. But when they're when they're told, you know, how awful they are, they don't share that. And so praise means virality. You've got all these people telling other members of Congress and others inside the DOD and elsewhere. Boy, the people love this. I got this wonderful tweet. You see what I'm talking about? In yeah. other words, praise them to victory and be graceful in victory. I don't want to hear a bunch of I told you so's. I want to hear nothing but grace from people because we're winning and let's win well. The only thing worse than a bad loser is a bad winner. And I played enough tennis to know what a bad winner is like. Oh, they're awful. We don't want to be bad winners. How do you I'm back? preaching now. Forgive me. How do you get back over to my house for another dinner? Talk about my cooking. That's all you got to do, Steve. And uh, uh, well, well, now you tell me. I've talked about your guitar playing. I've talked about your your production days. I've talked about your personality. I mean, my God. But okay. Yeah, it's I didn't cooking. know the cooking was that big a thing for you. It's but I it's will say that was a great meal that you provided. It so was. Let's, let's go there. It's the way to my heart. Okay, let, let's go to your what else in, in uh, the the UAP report. Now, again, you'll notice I'm picking out things that most people wouldn't have seized on. Well, that's but what in we the want. report. There's this this moment, right, which I kind of like. It's about flight safety concerns, right? And so they 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 go flight safety concerns and health implications UAP, and I'll get to that's important thing. Pose a safety of flight and collision hazard to air assets. Now, you know that these are the kinds of issues that make it comfortable for legislation to go forward and hearings to be held. I get it. OK. Potentially requiring aircraft operators to adjust flight patterns in response to their unauthorized presence in airspace operating outside of air traffic control standards and instruction. And then it says this. To date, there, there have been no reported collisions between U.S. aircraft and UAP. Why did they have to? Uh, that that stood stood out for me. Um, yeah. Why why have that in the report? Because it's true, right? And not only that, they don't specify a, a, a time frame. So I'm I'm assuming this goes back all the way to 1945. All right. So since 1945, there have been no reported collisions between U.S. aircraft and UAP. And then the very next paragraph starts with this. UAP continue to represent a hazard to flight safety and pose a possible adversary collection threat. Now that 
I get that. Okay, adversary collection threat. Put that aside. Since the publication of the ODNI preliminary assessment in June of 2021, UAP reporting has increased partially due to a concentrated effort to destigmatize the topic of UAP, very important statement, and instead recognize the potential risks that it poses as both a safety and flight hazard potential adversarial activity. Again, remember what I said at the beginning of this show, you've got to always remind yourself they've known for 70 years. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, here's what they're, they're doing. They're trying to be truthful. There's never actually been a collision with the UAP, okay? Because apparently they're damn nimble, these UAP, all right? It's really hard to crash into them, very hard. But nevertheless, this potential threat is, is helpful. So we need to emphasize and we need to mention it because, you know, uh, we want the politicians need a safe reason to get into this and not be embarrassed. So we're going to keep putting that out there, okay? And then they talk about the uh, increased in reporting activity, and they say it's partially due to concentrated effort to destigmatize the topic. That's kind of odd. That's not the reason there's been an increase, but uh, this idea of destigmatize uh, is important. One of the chief functions of this entire process is to do what you and I and all of our colleagues have been trying to do for years is de stigmatize the issue because the stigma on the issue supported by all those wonderful debunkers that we're so fond of most of which are dead now that you know just went out there to to heap the ridicule and so forth and undermine it has been one of the chief components of the truth embargo right the stigma the stink the stain whatever has helped to keep this under control for years they're literally saying we're trying to destigmatize it god bless them one of the reasons that people in this field, and because it started in this field, the government did not do this. People, our colleagues, including me, have worked to try to get UFO changed to UAP. Why? Because they mean the same thing, is that UFO has got tons of stigma attached to it and UAP doesn't. And so absent the stigma, you got your, your academics and your politicians and your members of Congress and so forth are able to say UAP without the stigma. It seems like a small thing, doesn't it? It's not small at all. If you go through all of the reports and all of the bills, I have word searched them. UFO is not in there anywhere. Nowhere. Okay. That is not trivial. And so they're destigmatizing. What does that mean? Well, what they're trying to say is that because there's less stigma, people are willing to report it more. Yeah, now, that's probably mind. true. Well, you said that that wasn't the case. Uh, that wasn't the reason. Well, I mean, reporting. the reason, the fundamental reason that reports are coming forward is because the the lid is off. Uh, it's out in the open. The, the the bar has come down. There also may be more ET activity. Um, and uh, so in a way, I guess you could. But it's not so much that the government has successfully destigmatized this. Uh, the process is moving forward in such a way that clearly people are more willing to come forward. But where this may apply, and this is something that people are missing, some people are missing, all of this stuff about reports that are turning up in the legislation and in the report that you get from ODNI is not about all the reports coming in around the country to MUFON and New Fork and all that other stuff. This is only about reports coming in through the system from people within the government. OK, the stuff that's going to move on, it's not included here. All right. And so there are far, there are far, far more than 400 reports that have turned in one way or another media, new, move, new, new fork and, and, and move on. They're just talking about the ones that come in from the system, from within the military intelligence and government community. Now, that's important because and I, I mean no disrespect, but. You take the quality of 400 reports that just turned in by the public to various uh, UAP organizations, and then you compare that to the quality of reports that are coming in from people within the military, Air Force, and what have you, the latter is far higher quality, obviously. Okay, These are far more significant reports, and that's where they're focusing. All right. Yeah, so that's well, you get sensor data and 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 video footage, and, uh, as well as you know professional eyewitness uh, accounts, you know from uh, uh, the military. I, I get that part of it. You're right; it's completely solid. But there is so much more, like 
Uh, let's go with just eyeballs from a commercial pilot. Oh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. No, no, I, I'm not saying Steve. that those are poor. I'm just saying in any any group of 400, Steve. this is a more powerful group. And 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 I think when you're Steve, talking about Steve, Steve, I'm stop. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. I was just uh, at JFK, just there. Yeah. And uh, like recently, recently, I was at JFK, and uh, there were four pilots standing there in uniform, and I just stroll right up. Hey, man, you guys, thanks, man, thanks. Yeah, yeah, great, 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 great. I said, hey, I, just just a question, uh, really quick. Um, you guys ever see a UFO? And I, I'm going to go right to left because that's the way it was like, no, no. And then these two looked at each other <laughs> right? and then yeah. turned to me and said, no. I thought it was, you know, you know, maybe kind of, well, maybe one, you know, not so sure. No, it was still, right? No, 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 no. Um, right in a row. And so the stigma, and I think that it is slowly changing, but this was just a random, you know, just a random sample, right? To be able to go up to four professional pilots like that and just hit them really quick in a, in a very smooth and nice way. I wasn't offensive at all. Did they know who you were? Um, I, I'm not going to get into that on this okay, show. But I'll, right. I'll, I'll talk to... Uh, That's all right. That's all right. That's off the air, but... But yeah, and so is it going to be the same way with this whistleblower part in in the NDAA? Uh, private industry is one thing, but will pilots start to take that serious, and especially with the Air Force? I'm glad this is a three-hour show because actually I'm going to be getting into that too. It's a very important it's a, area. It's a two-hour show. Two-hour show. Oh, my God. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> uh, caught me by surprise there. Look uh, – there is there there's stigma, which has been a critical part of the truth embargo, and then there's self interest, and they're not quite the same thing. No, they're not. In other words, um, a lot of the you know if, if if I if I didn't know you and I was a pilot or I thought you were in any way a celebrity or a journalist or something, I'm going to say no. In other words, uh, I'm I'm not going to discuss this issue or say anything that could jeopardize my work situation. That's that's uh, critical to my life. And so it's not a matter of stigma. It's about a simple logic and self-preservation and self-interest. So both of these things have been operating throughout the truth embargo. But uh, the point that I'm making uh, is this, that when when you read these reports, understand that almost everything is involving reports coming within government sources from from our services and so forth, uh, high level people, and that there's a lot of rules about how this is being done. A lot of people don't understand the rules that are being set up, and I'm going to get into that. Um, and so 400 reports with 100 not, uh, say 100 not accounted for, is that's a one very significant 100. Okay, that is a very profound 100. But again, that's that's all part of the process. All right. It doesn't matter whether it's 20 that aren't accounted for or 200. The government already knows they're here, but they are following the process and they're trying to tell the truth. If we got 400, we think 300 are accounted for 100 or not. Fine. That's all good. Now, the point I was making here, though, is because we're referring to reports coming from government sources, the stigma issue is a little more important, meaning any any destigmatization is going to make it a little easier for somebody working within government to step forward with a fully legitimate statement that is not breaking any NDAs. So I, I, I'm going to go along with that. The only other thing I want to mention about the report before I move on is this came up in the appendix. And in the appendix A, it mentions that an assessment of any health-related effects for individuals that have encountered unidentified aerial phenomena, I mean, it's referring to that section, and they would address that, all right? Very significant. Why? Big mm. deal. Help. Huge Help deal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Here's why it's a big deal for me. You know, if you're seeing a, a light in the sky 10 miles away, not much chance of health effect. Okay. I don't think health effects are coming into play there. You're probably going to have health effects if you get really close. 
to a craft. Okay. And so, but they're acknowledging is that there's some people that must've gotten pretty close to those craft and they had health effects. 100%. And so that without saying it specifically. Did, did it think? make you as angry as, as I was for them to have that in the OD and I report that, Oh no, at, at, uh, nobody got sick. Uh, no health issues to report here. Nothing to see. Let's move on. But yet, it is specifically addressed in the NDAA that this is a concern and health and, and, and contact with UAPs is a concern. And anybody that has been affected needs to have their uh, health taken care of. And here's how, here's how I avoid being angry about that. There are two different things. One is the legislation, which is buried in that act, right? Okay. Yes. And yes. all that funky language and everything. It, it is saying here is what needs to be done. The other is the report coming back to Arrow from the entities, giving them an update of what's going on. They're really two different things. It's much more important that the health effect issue be brought up in the legislation. It's less important that the ODI m mentioned in a report, unless uh, they, they uh, one of the entities uh, did some serious investigation and found three cases. They might mention that in a future report. So I'm not too too upset about that. And the other thing that was in the in the appendix, well, as we finish up with the NDA, uh, was in Appendix C that was covered. And this was I noted this. It says transmit. This is this, this section in the appendix covers transmedium objects or devices. Objects are and what and it's a definition. It's this is the definition section. What are transmedium objects or devices? Objects or devices that are observed to transition between space and the atmosphere or between the atmosphere and bodies of water uh, that are not immediately identifiable. Now, this is important because the moment you go and acknowledge that there are transmitting of medium, medium events taking place, you've just eliminated a huge swath of other explanations, okay? For instance, birds are out in terms of the space to air thing. Balloons are out with respect to the air to space, space to air thing. And when you go water uh, to uh, uh, air to water, water and out, that limit. So this is, this is acknowledging that one of the most significant uh, pieces of evidence we have are sightings of trans medium events. So again, they're not making a big deal out of it, but they're putting it out there. They're saying, yeah, we're aware of that too. This is all part of doing the right thing, all right? So when I read that, I'm pleased. Others will go, well, wait, wait, tell us about the transmedium events. That's post-disclosure. Now, since we're running, I'm moving along now. I'm going to go, I'm going into the uh, the, nope. uh, the F FY20. By the way, that was mostly the appendix and the report, not the uh, NDAA. Uh, now no, we're getting to the NDAA. Uh, no, let's still go to the NDAA yet. I want to specifically go back to the 171 number uh, that was there in the report. Yeah. Right. And 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 in that section where I don't have it in front of me, but there was a, a very important sen sentence there that said some of these UAPs exhibit extraordinary right yeah. flight characteristics, right. Uh, uh, propulsion systems. And that uh, obviously that that requires further attention. Mm -hmm. But it, d does that does that set off an alarm bell uh, for the rest of the world going, wait a minute. So it's not trash bags. Right. It's not weather balloons. We know that it's not Chinese drones. We're talking about something that pilots and, and you know, military witnesses are going. It was nuts, man. You should have seen this thing. You know, because that's what would uh, constitute a sentence like that. Well, again, the thing is, you know, the alarm bells is I'm not, you know, not alarm bells because uh, the public has been polled on this issue for decades. I mean, there's been dozens and dozens of polls. I've got a bunch of them listed. The public has been on this for a long, long time. So the idea of something traveling incredibly fast, which would be extraordinary uh, 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 evidence, they know that. They know that's been in play for a long time. So that's not scary. They go very fast. Uh, what? But you say, okay, but they're mentioning it, aren't they? All right. Look, basically, if something something solid flies by at 15,000 miles in the atmosphere, it's not human. N humans didn't make it. Case closed over. All right. But we can't do that. We can't 
close the case yet. We've got to go through this process leading to the disclosure event, which confirms that it's extraterrestrial. Then we move on to get into the details. So these things are going to come up and people are saying, well, if you said that, why didn't you follow it up? And they're, they're missing my key point. The reason they're saying it is because this this they have to go through it this way and conduct it this way to get to where they need to go, which is the disclosure event. The confirmation is what opens the door to everything else. And so they are they're always going to hold stay within certain boundaries. They'll go so far. They are trying very hard not to specifically lie. In other words, not to outright lie, uh, but to to be relatively um, appropriate and honest at what they do say. Mm -hmm. And so they are saying things which are important and, and valid. They don't come to the conclusions that obviously they should come to because that's not what's happening now. And that's for later. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's so complicated. I understand people are probably a little frustrated, but um, just keep well, it in I, mind. Yeah. But I don't, look they don't go so far because there's a reason to why they're doing this. Yeah. But I don't look at it that way. Um, I look at it when you look at a number that big, 171, and that's a crazy friggin' big number for six or a year or less worth of, of reports and sightings coming in that exhibit this kind of stuff. You have to uh, have a team in place of researchers to go in and look at that data, uh, interview uh, the pilots and the crew members that witnessed this, and all of that takes time. You, you just can't do that kind of uh, investigation on that many cases in such a short period of time. That's my point, and that's why it throws off a red flag. Well, um, I think they're, they're, they're accounting for the reports that are coming in, and uh, if, if, they're, if they're being somewhat fast with it, again, keep in mind, they already know that they're non-human craft, right? So they don't need to study it too hard <laughs> if they already know. And so again, yeah, there's a lot of things that logically you would think they would do that. And you're going, why didn't they? And I'm trying to get back to my key point is the reason that they don't do it that way is because that's not what this is about. This is not an effort to find out what this stuff is. They already know. This is a process that they're going to go through in order to get to hearings and the proper procedures that will set the stage for disclosure. Now, I know this is for some a little bit hard to grasp, but what can I say? One, one, let me put it this way. The simplest way to get to where I'm at is simply go read The Witness to Disclosure by Carrie and Schmidt. It's an absolute case closed book. Roswell absolutely was what it was. So again, once you know and, have, and, and understand that Roswell was in fact what it was, a crashed ET vehicle with bodies, then you know that the government's known since 47. Case closed on that. So once you're there, then you can say, okay, if they've known since 47, how do I view what's going on now with all of this activity and legislation and, 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 and actions by the DOD? How do I view it in that context, right? And I'm trying to help in that regard. And it's it's easy, not easy. And I know I'm confusing some people. No, you're not. Your point is well taken, Steve. Okay. The, um, the trash bag, the, we're, we're, let's move on to the NDAA. But mm -hmm. uh, the trash bag uh, comment and airborne debris, my only, uh, I could, you know, it, it's nothing for me. But my, um, what raises a concern is how does that rise to the level of UAP and worthy of submitting a report. If you know it's a trash, if it's a trash, if you know, if that's what it is, then how, why, why file that report? What's the no, concern? No no. no, no, no. I think you're, look, the, the, the reports, people, people within the government, people within the military intelligence complex are, or military services are reporting something they see and couldn't understand. In other words, they saw it. They didn't know it was a trash bag. If they knew it was a trash bag, they wouldn't report it. So they're reporting it, and they're taking whatever they're getting. They're not saying, look, unless you're really sure or you know, whatever, it's really weird, don't come see it. Look, if it's unidentified and it's in our space and it's near our ships, whatever, report it. And then they do a quick analysis and discover it's a trash bag. Okay. And to their credit, they report that. 
And to their credit, they also report that we have no idea what the hell this one was. Remember, Project Blue Book was a whitewash. The whole thing was a total whitewash to try to get the government out from under it. And after all the stuff they went through to whitewash it, they still came up with 701 reports they couldn't account for. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But um, what, what the point that I'm making here is that uh, a trash bag is I, I, I'm not wrong. A trash bag is not going to turn up as a trash bag in sensor data. It's going to be a trash bag because of what they saw. Oh, some of the reports are visual. Some of them reports are spatial visual sighting. That's right. Guys so, on a ship see why, something. So, why is why are trash bags getting into this report? It's not because of a, a FLIR picked up a trash bag no. and, and, and radar uh, kicked off and they scrambled jets. And this was, no, that's not. And they had to go figure out that it was a trash bag. I don't think that's the case. I don't they, know how they arrived at that, Jimmy, but I think they're just, they, actually, I, I applaud them what they're doing. They're saying, look, we want reports. We are going to look at these reports and, and we're going to provide information about what we find. And so the reports come in, they look at them. And if one of them turns out to be a trash bag, they, they they say that. All right. In other words, they're telling the truth. Now, one could say, how could some guy on a ship mis mistake that? I, I don't know. But I don't think it's an attempt to undermine the fundamental process. People say, well, it's a trash bag. Well, that, look how silly this is. No, because of the ones they can't identify. Remember, they're coming in for military people, high level people that can that know what they're looking at. And they're unable to figure it out. So the, the core message is, look, there's plenty out there we can't explain, which pretty much confirms what we already know. Yeah, there's there's non-human craft here. I'm sure that a lot of them would like to get it over with tomorrow and just suddenly put out a press release and say enough, enough with this. Yeah, it's it's there's non-human craft. Uh, we need to get the details to you. But they can't. This is a hugely political process. There's so much at stake. It's got to be done right. And the sooner it's done, the better for them as well. Now, along those lines, some of the things, just, well, it's just a list of just some of the things that have happened recently. First of all, Christopher Mellon puts out, and I've got that, I've got that up here too. Christopher Mellon puts out this extraordinary statement uh, uh, on his website. Yeah, uh, it's at 15,000 words. It was half a, it was like war and peace. You're talking yeah, about it's called setting the record straight. It's called it's a manifesto of intent. He 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 he's given the excuse to write it because of those articles that turned up in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Mm -hmm. This gentleman by the name of uh, of uh, uh, Holman W. Jenkins Jr., who is on the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, puts out two hit pieces. You know, it's like, hey, eh, bullshit, nonsense. All right. And now he is on the editorial board, but his columns are about business. Whatever. These these articles are not going to wear well. But then Julian Barnes, who was like the national security guy for The New York Times, he writes a piece that's kind of very much critical. OK, look, why they have got written, I don't know. Uh, I do know this, that when you're talking about journalists at the high level, they all have their own sources. In other words, and they don't they're all the same sources. And so one has certain sources within the DOD, other has other sources, some within the Air Force and what have you. And they're off the record by and large. But they're known and they're they're already reported to the editors, so they will talk about them. They will say unknown source said this. And so it's not surprising if there are some sources within the DOD that are not happy about this process and they want to throw a little water on it. So they contact their 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 favorite journalist, the New York Times, and report some stuff. And that person treats it as valid and writes it up. It's also also possible, and I wouldn't rule this out that some of these major papers like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, particularly the New York Times, have a problem. In other words, they're, they're saying, you know, look, we're writing all these articles. We're covering it like crazy. Most of them are without any skepticism. It's going to start looking like we're on the disclosure train. You know, we got on board with, with, a, with a free ticket. And we're in the we're in the uh, the VIP car shipping champagne. Somebody write something negative, for God's sakes. Right. So we don't look like we're we're, you know, uh, you know in, in, in the deal. Uh, and that could be that could be the reason. But whatever. These uh, you're, you're, you're Julian a pass card. In, I know what I'm getting, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm simply saying that these gave Christopher Mellon the excuse to write this really fantastic. He, he wrote statement. a great piece. He wrote a great right. piece. And it turns out, see, here's the thing. Now, now, now we have hindsight. 
uh, I think that we all felt that Julian Barnes piece was an opinion piece and, yeah. and uh, unnamed sort and, and this and that, and he had some kind of inside track and it, and it turned out he was completely wrong. And, and that now doesn't that, mean he didn't have an inside track. Man, it just well, means he might've been given bad information by his sources, which he trusts. Yeah. Eh, but maybe not. Yeah. I'm just but, I'm just happy he was wrong because the the piece itself was an opinion piece and it should have never been published, and 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 now I hope that he never writes another piece like this again. I really encourage people to read this statement. It's on Christopher Mellon's site, ChristopherMellon.net. It's also linked on my website. It's linked on my my social media because. He doesn't just do a rebuttal. He goes through a history of what's happened since the two of the stars Academy come out. It's like him saying, Hey folks, let's, let's don't forget. This is what has happened. Now, remember Christopher Mellon, in my view, is the central figure to all that's going on. Meaning if you want to take all the various elements and entities and you want to look into that center, you're going to see Christopher Mellon. There was a time in a much different time when things were nothing like they are now, when I would have said the central figure going on to whatever the hell's happening within government and, and politics was John Podesta. OK, but that was a different time. Christopher Mellon has taken it way past that. And when I say central, I mean central. He is the one that's been going up on the hill. He started going up the hill back in, I think, 18, 19. He's had tons of meetings up there. He's helping to orchestrate what's happening on the hill. He's kind of like a consultant in that regard. And so he has literally been key to the process going forward. And so when he writes this summary piece, he's saying, look, folks, look how far we've come. Look what's going on here. So this piece is that article in the paper is ridiculous. But I'm also going to remind you of where we are right now, which is very, very far along. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Just a couple days later is when Robert Salas, Captain Robert Salas, one of the principal witnesses to nuclear weapons tampering, sends out a tweet and says, uh, I've been contacted to come in and be interviewed by Arrow. Mm -hmm. And I've been asked to contact some of the other witnesses. Now, think about those things happening virtually together. You don't. You don't, if you're Arrow, you do not bring in Bob Salas to interview except for one reason. You are getting prepared for him to testify before Congress. Seems that the way. The way it works is, and a lot of people don't know this, but before any of those witnesses sit down on under oath in that chair with cameras on and millions of people watching, they're going to be interviewed by the DOD or the appropriate entity. They're going to be interviewed by some of the committee staff so that they know what they're generally going to say so that they can shape the questions they're going to ask, not to influence them, not to undermine them, but rather, to, you know, you just don't fly this thing blind. So, it will improve the questions, but be assured, once those witnesses sit down under oath, they can say whatever the hell they want. So if they're asked a question, they decide, hey, I'm going to tell you about what happened. No, that can happen. But this is the process. And so basically, the interview process is underway. Then, then a few days later, Kevin Day indicates that apparently he's preparing to testify. And if they've contacted Kevin Day, they probably contacted Fravor, Graves, and Dietrich. And who knows what else? And so what are we hearing here? Mellon is gearing up. He just gave you a review. Witnesses are being interviewed by Arrow. All right. Hearings are in the process. There have been other statements that have been made. All right. And so hearings are coming. They will be in the Senate. They will almost certainly be the Senate Intel Committee. And that's how far we've gone. So that happened. OK. Now, something else that's been happening lately, which I have to talk about because it's cool, is that of all the people that have been hearing about this issue in Congress, Scores of them have been gotten briefings, right? Classified briefings. Remember, this report that just came out had a classified version, and mm -hmm. that's where the real action is, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about There's about eight or nine members of Congress now that have actually gone and, and made statements to press and have been written up. One of them, though, is not one of those that are getting these heavy briefings. He's on some important committees, but not the ones that are in play here, Right. He's he's a Tennessee conservative Republican. He's what in the I think I would say I don't think this is an insult. He's what in Britain they refer to some of the MPs as backbenchers. OK, but no, he's a he's a he's a congressman and he's into this issue. 
And so he is the most outspoken of all of them, probably because he's not really part of the process that I'm referring to. He's sitting out there, but he sees what's going on, and he says, I'm going to speak up. His name is Tim Burchett, and boy, is he speaking up. <laughs> he, first of all, he, he spoke out on the ET issue before the first hearing. It was held by Carson right back in May. He, he speaks out very aggressively. Then he goes to the hearing, makes sure the press sees him there. And after the hearing's over, he starts giving interviews to the press. Mm -hmm. Since then, he's been on Tucker. He's been on these shows. And he keeps saying the extraterrestrial presence is real. Okay. There's ETs here. He's doing a Bob Bigelow. Only he's doing it every three months. So recently, he just turned up again. Right. Let me just go into this. Tim Burchett has turned up and, and, he's, and there's been several media that's covered him. And this is what he's saying now. He says the U.S. UF government is covering up the truth about unidentified flying objects. He told Newsmax and several other entities. And then he goes in first chapter of Ezekiel. It pretty much described what you would call a modern day UFO. He says he's a religious God. He says, you look at all the organized religions that we recognize in the world today from the Muslims, the Hindus. They describe something we would consider a UFO. I think they're hiding former crash sites. He said, you should go back to Roswell, New Mexico. In 1947, there was a craft, two crafts apparently crashed. I've been told there was a midair collision. And then he goes on, he says, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, so when the headline saucer recovered across the country, the next day they said, oh, wait, no, it was a weather balloon. And that's just totally bogus. Tim Burchett is like, He's like the person that goes to that meeting, you know, the, the stockholders meeting and stands up and starts telling, you know, the, the, the guys that have the most stocks, what the hell is going on? This is this is interesting. Right. Tim Burchett is telling the truth. He's saying it flat out. Whether he had any classified briefings doesn't matter. He probably got some information from those that did get the classified briefings and he is stepping up. And you know what's happening? Nothing. Now, what do I mean by that? Is Tim getting briefed? Is he getting attacked? No, not at all. Hasn't affected him politically at all. You know, one one other thing he said that you left out there um, is he said, this is a, an elected representative, right? Yeah. He said, I don't trust the government, right? It's, it's right in the middle of that line. Yeah. And uh, I thought that that was uh, an extraordinary thing. And when he, after the UFO hearing, um, when he got in front of the camera and 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 let loose, he had said he called the hearing a sham because it, it, it didn't seem to go anywhere. Right. right. He, he's not he's not onto the process, but I get it. Yeah. 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 He, so, is, so, he is upset. What's happening here? Rubio and Warner, Carson, Gallego, all these people are coming out and doing this and putting legislation in. What's the political consequences? Nothing. All right. Burchett really going to town. Consequences politically. Nothing. Right. Burchett's a Republican. You've got Republicans and Democrats. They fully established this thing as a nonpartisan issue. It's safe. And more and more members of Congress are going to decide, you know, it's safe. Look at Burchett. I don't I don't want to. I'm not a potted plant here. This is going to be huge. They're going to start. You're going to see more of them coming forward and speaking. So. When people say, look, this thing is all going to die out, they're going to stretch it out. No, no, no. This is a this is this is this is a raging fire. It is moving forward. It cannot be stopped. So that's what I want to make the point. Now, I want to get into the NDA because there's two things here that are extremely critical. This is serious in the NDA of 2023 that assuming you can read it. And I'll tell you, it's not easy because we're talking legislative speak. And one of them involves. NDAs, right? And National Defense Appropriation uh, Act. One of them involves NDAs. Let me read this to you. This is a big deal. All right. Uh, in case people miss it. Okay. Hang on. Uh, okay. Okay. It's under, it's section three and it's called non-disclosure agreements. Now I, I invite you to listen carefully. The secretary of defense, the director of national intelligence, the two people that are running this, or overseeing the Secretary of Homeland Security, the heads of such other departments and agencies of the federal government that have supported investigations of the types of events covered by subparagraph A, meaning at any time in the past, of subsection A1, and activities and programs described in subparagraph B of such um, 
of such subsection and contractors of the federal government that have um, uh, supported or are supporting such activities and programs shall conduct comprehensive searches of all records relating to non-disclosure orders relating to the types of events described uh, in subsection A. In other words, all these cases and things that have happened in the past, you've been associated with it. If, if there's any non-disclosures associated with that, you need to provide copies of such orders and agreements or obligations to ARO. What are they saying? They're saying everybody out there in all of the agencies involved in this cross-agency group and elsewhere who have non-disclosures relating to UAP type events, send them to us. Send them a copy of all of them to us. My God, do you realize what information is in those? So the arrow is going to be collected. Now, still not for release to the public. Non-disclosure agreements describing why there's a non-disclosure agreement. What is the issue that's not being disclosed and who was signed on to it? It's like a roadmap to the entire history of the internal investigations. Send them on. Does it mean they will or not? Don't know. If they don't, they're going to have a problem. But then it goes further. It says the head of the office shall accessible to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The head of the office, meaning Arrow, shall make the records compiled under this subparagraph A accessible to the congressional defense committees, the congressional intelligence committees, and the congressional leadership, which means leadership that may not even be on those committees. The legislation says that all these non-disclosure agreements, which are not going to be made public, are going to come to us and we're going to send them to the members of Congress who will then find out all these things that were, quote, not to be disclosed, the issue involved and the people that were signed on. Do you have any idea, assume, you know, without getting into any leaks or anything like that, what that information will do to all of these key committee members? It will set their hair on fire. This is for them the ultimate reveal, in a sense, without getting into actual programs. It's in the legislation. It's by law. A lot of people don't even know that's there. So there's that. Now there's something else. And this is like something I really like. Okay. This is really cool on two levels. Ten minutes. I can pull this off. This is under protection for individuals making authorized disclosures. Now, let me make something clear. All of these reports are, and these disclosures we're talking about are authorized. In other words, they actually follow certain rules. If, they, if, if it's under an NDA, it is not an authorized disclosure. Right. If it violates national security, it's not an authorized disclosure. So when they talk about disclosures that are coming in from the witnesses, they're talking about those that do not violate those rules, which they specify. But but and but but nevertheless, they don't violate the rules, but they're still important and they're being brought forward. OK, so people that are bringing forward appropriate disclosures about this issue, sightings, whatever the hell, that don't violate the, the conditions that we have ascribed in, earlier in the in the law. shall not be subject to a non dis I'm sorry. All right, I'm sorry. Protection for individuals making authorized uh, disclosures. Authorized disclosures. An authorized disclosure entered into by an individual who makes the disclosure shall be deemed to comply with any regulations or order issued under authority executive order 1326 and so forth. That's what I was trying to tell you. He can't violate those rules, okay? It, but if, if it doesn't, and it is not a, a violation, okay, all right, then it is going to be received. And now comes the key part. Prohibition on reprisals. An employee or a department or agency of the federal government or of a subcontractor, subcontractor, grantee, subgrantee, or personal services contractor of such a department or agency who has authority to take, direct others to take, recommend, or approve any personnel action shall not with respect to such authority take or fail to take or threaten to take or fail to take a personnel personnel action, including the revocation of suspension of security clearances or termination of employment with respect to any individual as a reprisal for any authorized disclosure. What this says by law is that if there is an authorized disclosure by anybody within the, the system here and you take a reprisal, that is against the law. That is against this act. You can't do that anymore. They're basically taking the, the ability for people to keep those subtle pressures on away. 
That doesn't mean they won't try, but they're taking it away. Right. Now, here's what's really cool about this. In the Senate version of the act, which was which was sponsored by Warner, he didn't write it all, but his you know, he had staff that do it. But sure, he signed off on everything. So we're talking Mark Warner, the current chairman of the Intel Committee. He put this additional language in the Senate version of the act, which did not make it through reconciliation. But note what he was willing to see in the reconciled bill. Any case in which an employee described in paragraph two, the one I just read to you, takes a personnel action against an individual in violation of such paragraph, the individual could be a pilot, could be a Navy person, could be a member of the DI, whatever the hell, may bring a private civil action for all appropriate remedies, including injunctive relief and compensatory and punitive damages against the government and it, or it, other it, employer. It, it, is that where the three hundred thousand dollar number gets extended? Is is it in that section? No, it's not in the section. This is that and one there, paragraph. It's in the Senate bill or right. other employer who took the personnel action in a federal district court of competent jurisdiction. Warner was willing to put into the final signed bill the right of government employees to sue the government and their boss if they screw with them on an authorized disclosure. Does, yeah, well, do you understand how unbelievable that is, how incredible that is? It is incredible. I'm saying that later on in the NDA, uh, specifically addressing that, that the cap for a whistleblower to sue or compensation was three hundred thousand dollars, and you know, so if that was there, it was probably taken out too. No, because I no, didn't see no, it. It's it, 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 the final bill. It, it, it's in there, and that it can exceed that number now. It can well, exceed. This is interesting. The, I'm going to look yeah. into that because technically, if they didn't now, put in this, uh, Steve, Steve, who does yeah. this apply to? Uh, I if, the simple thing would be uh, pilots and uh, enlisted anybody. Members. Anybody but, reporting within the uh, an authorized disclosure within the the investigations that Arrow is doing. It's not referring to people that are going to move on with a problem. It's referring to people in government. In other words, the whole focus but, oh, of this project is to make it easier for witnesses to come forward so they have as many witnesses available to them for the hearings. Because you can't have a powerful witness if you don't know they exist. And you don't yeah. know they exist so they don't come forward. Yeah, yeah, but that's not my question. So yeah. you can't answer the question if, if I can't ask it. <laughs> so let's try this again. Um, uh, military, I understand. Government, I understand. But what about the private sector? What about Lockheed? What about uh, you know something that is going on, a private security subcontractor that is uh, uh, securing uh, Area 51 that has witnessed? Easy answer. Uh, Easy answer. Yeah, look, on, it, it says it right in there. This bill is covering contractors, defense contractors. All right, it is. It does. It's not covering any contractor. You'd be making, I don't know, uh, footstools. The point is, is that if if you are a defense contractor and a UAP thing is is involved in your world, and somebody does an authorized disclosure about it, right? They're covered. That means civilian well, people. Now, again, you, you know how hard it is. You know how hard, the, how much effort the government goes to to prevent people from suing it. I mean, it's very hard. They go to all kinds, they all pass all kinds of laws. You can't sue the government. Warner was willing to put in the bill that in this particular case you can sue. Now, I'm going to look about this 300,000. Maybe the language somewhat relevant to this is turned up elsewhere in the bill. It's very large. If I find it, I'll, I'll, I'll get you an email on that. But th again, this is a small thing. But remember, that head of the Intel Senate Intel Committee was putting into the bill he sponsored at the Senate level the right to sue people that screw with you. Remember how it used to be? Uh, yeah, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have talked about that siding, Airman. Uh, you're never flying again. We're putting you on a desk, right? The, you know, near yes. the Bering Sea. Okay. And by the way, your wife is divorcing you. That's the way it used to be. Now this is the way. It yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that cool or what? Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. And uh, it, it, it's when you see, I brought up earlier, the report that is now required by law for the ODNI and the DOD to go back to January 1st, 1945 and investigate all of the military reports about UFOs. Well, that is by law. And right. the, class of un the classified report is also by law. Yes. Okay. And they're getting all of that. 
But it, as cool as those classified reports may be, and we hear they're pretty cool, right? Because because what's happening is other members of Congress are learning about it, you know, at the cocktail table, and they're starting to talk about it. The non-disclosure agreement paragraph is mind blowing. I mean, technically, there should have been a revolt, right, in the military intelligence complex where they were, pick, you know, picketing, you know, the Pentagon, saying, "No, no, we cannot possibly do that." Regardless of how many NDA copies end up turning up in Arrow or get passed on to Congress, there will be some. Equally important is this sends a clear message to everybody out there that thinks that they're going to be able to get by with this and that we'll, with the, 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 the truth embargo will continue on. We'll skate like we did in, in 52, 47, uh, also 90, 96, 95. They're Clinton. No, it's over. Right. It's over. Get on board. Let's move on with this. So my prediction right now, I feel really confident about this. And I'm glad that the project I'm involved is so huge because, you know, I think we're going to materially be able to affect this, right, in, in very important ways. If I am uh, Mark Warner, man, I have a hearing this January. I get these witnesses start the process and we're holding a witness on this incredibly significant issue. The, the attention of the public will be galvanized. Now, I'm going to go partisan for a second, but it's I'm, I'm simply stating you know, reality here. Don't, don't torch me. Warner has a chance to put that going on in the Senate at the same time. And the, in the, in the Democrat consult Senate at the same time, the Republican house is going nuts. All right. And you have this profound comparison from a purely partisan political basis. They got to hold those hearings. Now I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going Democrat Republican here. I'm simply saying that is the reality right now. They have a chance to start the hearings in a Democrat controlled Senate. The process is underway. Everything is half set up and it just happens to be a stark contrast to the House. Is that going to play a factor? And even if it did, they're not going to admit it. But I'm saying this, you know, when Bob Salas is being interviewed by Arrow, you need to start planning your, your trips to Washington. OK, because those hearings will be open to the public. You're going to have to get in line very, very early. I'm going to pay somebody to get in line for me. You know, it's one of those line sitters. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And then uh, I'm going to try to get in the front. I want to be in the front row when Bob Salas sits down. So when you focus on Bob, you're going to be saying, is that Bassett behind him there? That is Bassett. <laughs> right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> um, before I let you go, Steve, um, I saw some chatter today on social yeah. media that involved you. Um, really? I need clarification here um that there is a steven spielberg ufo documentary series that is getting ready to come out and that you you had something to do with it no i i i not something to do with it i found out about it and i put it out oh, uh, so let me not- tell you i've been i've been in hollywood now for almost a year um and this town is this town is crawling with UAP projects, okay, in various yeah. levels. Yeah, okay? they are. Yeah. Most of them are not being talked about, right? Okay, uh-huh. for a lot of reasons. But I I can say that I played a small part in bringing this about. The film industry that is made well in excess of a hundred billion dollars, way above a hundred billion dollars on fictional movies about ETs, has finally realized that there may be even greater glory by taking those resources and putting it on the real deal. And they're seeing eyeballs by the millions and they're jumping in. Let me tell you, they're in it to make money, but there's plenty of people in this town that know that the truth embargo should end. They want to do the right thing. And so you're about to see Hollywood rise up and say, government like what you're doing, but we're not going to let you skirt on this, right? We got documentary streaming series. We got so much stuff in the works. You wouldn't believe it. And one of the things I'm going to be hope, hoping to help is make sure that a lot of this content covers those other people we're talking about. McDonald, Keo, right? Uh, Hynek, you name it. All of these people who were the, the, the founders and the people that carry the water for all these years. Hey, massive stories here. So let's get them up on the big screen. Let's get the narrative films. Let's do docs. Let's because most of the world is for, don't, doesn't know that history. Most of the people on this planet are under 30, right? They need to find out about the people that that to st- started to try to tell the truth to the American people starting on day one, Jesse Marcel. 
They need to know about all of them because this isn't just history. This is the biggest history you will ever live in if you're, if you're reincarnated another hundred times. I mean, you're right about that. You're, you're right about that. You know, uh, uh, certainly James, you know, McDonald and, and, and uh, Leonard Stringfield, you know. The, on and on. Yeah, it's, it's just great. Rappel. Jesse you know. Marcel. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. All yeah. of these people are heroes. They should all get the friggin' Medal of Freedom. Well, you know, there was a time and then they just disappear into history, like the early black civil rights people in the 1800s. But this isn't then. This is the age of the Internet, social media and mass participation. It's the age of people, 14 year old kids with 13, uh, you know, level 13 iPhones doing high level films in their basement. Whatever the hell. There is no way that all of that history is somehow just going to disappear. It's, it's, it's going to be covered. And I can tell you. This town is on board and happening. And, you know, we're, we're one of the one of the reasons that we're very happy what's happening now is that we're 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 watching the competition. We're watching all this stuff developing and we're really going to get run over. I mean, it's going to be the it's going to be like the Oklahoma land rush with the thousand Conestogas racing forward to get a piece of land. This town has figured it out. And by the way, the big, the big shots in this town that have known ET presence was real going back the last 60 years, I assure you. They're connected. They're wealthy. They're brilliant. You don't think they're going to tipped off? They made a conscious decision. We're going to do the fiction on this. People love it. We understand why. We're not going to poke the bear. We're not going to go there, but we're going to put out the fiction. I'm not going to argue with that. They made a decision. It wasn't their best interest. Maybe it wasn't. That's changing. You know. So now all of a sudden, hey, and and and, and one of the key look. M- one of the reasons that I ended up in this is because of a development over a bad robot, right? Which is not connected to the project. But you know, uh, uh, one of the biggest players in this town, J.J. Abrams, takes on a reclamation project, puts a couple million into it, puts out UFO on Showtime. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people say, so what? What? When somebody at that level puts money behind a docuseries on the UAP issue, right, on a studio that's one of the biggest in town – you know how many people got that message around this town? And so, yeah, the Spielberg is just one of many, many projects in the works. Uh, they're going to start pouring out uh, pretty soon, and you're going to see some things from my neck of the woods. Steve, thank you so much, my friend. An absolute amazing uh, conversation. Uh, I want to bring you back. Uh, we've got an announcement that we're going to do uh, in about three weeks. We'll do it right here on Fade to Black, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Okay. Fantastic. And the, look, uh, I might, my, 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 uh, my, my net messaging is always on. You, you can send the dinner invitation via SMS. That's fine. Later. <laughs> See you later, Steve, Steve Bassett. Right. Thank you so much, my friend, uh, the absolute very best. And uh, with that tomorrow night, I am going to, Oh, so uh, paradigm research group, all of uh, Steven's links. And of course, uh, Twitter, Uh, We've got everything up and out there, and you can do it over on our website or throughout our social media. Go follow Steve. It's uh, uh, PRG, uh, Paradigm Research Group, on Twitter. Easy to find. We've got it up there. All right. And so with that, tomorrow night here on Fade to Black, I've got astrologer David Palmer with us, the Leo King. And it's a very important show. Why? Because right now we've got a green comet that is approaching Earth. It has just rounded the sun. It's going to be visible for the rest of the month, naked eye, right here from planet Earth. So what implications is this going to have, right? We're going to do all of that tomorrow night with David Palmer, the Leo King. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music. Doug Aldridge, intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR with the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission for Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with David, the Leo King Palmer, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.